Um, you've probably very often sat down with a new person, starting a new, uh, a new meeting, a new investigation into someone's life as a psycho, psychotherapist. Now, this conversation will be mostly about men's groups, but there's probably plenty of uh, parallels. Not really. In fact, I'm discouraging parallels in that when people phone about men's groups, they're often thinking as though there's some sort of a therapeutic angle. And that doesn't have to be. You know, just that the main strength of the men's movement is really as simple as just talking. It doesn't have to have a therapeutic aim. But still, it can be a therapeutic endeavor. Oh, I think it's they're very beneficial, absolutely. Now help me understand then that what the difference is, you say. That if people see men's groups as a means to an end, that, oh yes, I need to do this to, as a treatment goal to overcome my depression or my divorce or something like that, then it's, it's sort of in that therapeutic language of... of of healing and some sort of a path versus guys just debriefing their lives. Oh, how, how has it been since we last met as men? What's gone on in our life? What do we need to think out loud about? It's not that, oh, I, I need to get, you know, a service or be delivered from something I'm dealing with in my life. I may not be delivered from my pain at all. And I'm just, it's just nice to have the fellowship of other men to talk with, that kind of thing. So is there a difference in, in language in giving feedback? For oh, absolutely. The... Absolutely. In that, in the men's groups that, that, that I've been in and that I promote is that, first of all, you don't get feedback unless you ask for it. So, you know, it can be irresistible to give somebody feedback if somebody's doing something that seems to be so utterly stupid or wrong. You know, it's very hard to keep one's mouth shut, but, you know, let the person say what they're saying. And then, I mean, what a little game I play is that, let's say you and I are in a men's group, and I may say, you know, the only way in the world I would ever suggest what you should do is if you asked me. And I would just leave it, and then you would, of course, go, oh, Mark, what do you think I should do? Oh, well, geez, you know get out of that or whatever you're doing that's that's like you're walking off a plank or something so so you know the, the spirit of the men's group movement that i've been involved in is that you only get advice if you ask for it or somebody you know sort of nudges you towards it but um no the main idea of just fellowship have there been insights that you gained in the men's group that you were able to use in your profession oh yeah I mean, one of the main insights is to uh, normalize things that professionally as a counselor, my clients tend to think they're more screwed up than they are. Now, I've got clients who are way more screwed up than they think they are. That happens, of course. But the majority of people are so self-conscious, they really think they're a bigger mess than they really, really are because they don't talk to anybody. They've got no way of knowing, you know, well, what else is going on with other men, et cetera. So, um, you know, for what it's worth, not that I'm a, the decider of what's normal or something, but by being in the, in, involved with men's groups and the movement, you know, that started up, you know, more in the 80s and then took off more in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, et cetera, was around, you know, honoring a male way of feeling that really wasn't that acknowledged. At that time, it was like women were very good at asserting, you know, gee, this is a feminine mentality or feminism, et cetera, et cetera. And men didn't really think in those terms of that, oh, there's a male psychology or there's a male temperament, et cetera, et cetera. Aside from stereotypes, you know, like, you know, uh, macho or something like that. But... There wasn't much of um, of an introspection on that. So, uh, I mean, I've always said, if people talked more with each other, I'd be out of business. 
My job didn't exist 150 years ago. Um, it's totally a, an artifact of modern society. I'm, I'm glad you bring up maleness. How does one get an idea of um, Well, first of all, is it is it important to to um, to work on one's maleness to somehow um, uh, fortify it or to um, um, unfold it? Um? Well, um, rather than to think of it as something that's to be worked upon, it's rather something to just be acknowledged that. Most people are sort of, I mean, the sense I have is that most are kind of unconscious of it. That, oh, we're all ideally like sort of gender free or we're all just people and people are the same, kind of. Well, not really. I mean, yes, you know, in terms of civil liberties, we're all equal in terms of, you know, laws, etc. At least ideally we should be. I mean, that's the struggle we have, you know, as a society. But no, we aren't equal uh, in our temperaments, our psychologies, our proclivities, etc. That it's perfectly fine to to acknowledge it and accept it, uh, rather than to work on it. So, um, and and it's very wide that that you know, say that that in the gay movement, that's sort of a different angle. And sometimes people think, oh gosh, are you guys a gay group? Is it a gay thing or something? No, it's not a gay thing. It's a male thing. But but gays are very keen on, you know, identifying, you know, that identity as in terms of sexual orientation. And if you just extrapolated it more, okay, aside from sexual orientation, okay, well, what is it about men, period? You know, so, um, you know, uh, it's more like that. Can I feel at home in my maleness rather than having to work on something? Oh, God, I have to contrive myself to be this or that kind of man. No, just can you feel comfortable or, or at home with it? It's more the challenge. But what if a man shows up who's in a relationship and it's not going well? And um, he, you kind of feel that while well, he is... He, He's not really, doesn't have a strong will. <clears throat> he kind of just says, yes, I'll do that, darling, and uh, go along with whatever she wants, um, being indecisive, perhaps. So <clears throat> these are qualities that we, or plenty of people, consider masculine. Wouldn't you say that, well, maybe we need to work on your masculinity? No, it would be more, I mean, that dynamic certainly happens in relationships with women. It could happen anywhere. It could happen with an employer. It could happen with anybody. Just that, hey, are you standing up for yourself? Why are you, you know, surrendering more than you need to, et cetera? So it'd be more like sort of encouragement or coaching for that person to protect their rights rather than, oh, you know, you're, you're, denying a part of your malehood. Actually, accommodating a woman is very typically male. I mean, that's that's mostly how we keep peace. That, you know, as a basic strategy of, of keeping peace at home, there's, I mean, I'm not against appeasement. You know, as long as it doesn't cause damage, that, okay, you know, let's pick and choose which fights are worth fighting. And I'm not going to Take on that fight with my wife, let's say, fine, fine. But there may be others that I do want to take on, and having the fellowship of the men's group gives me encouragement or support to do that. I may still wimp out and not defend my rights, but it's nice to have these guys in my corner that I can think out loud with. You know, so, so uh, you know, I think of it more in that kind of an angle that... I mean, sometimes it's irresistible. People will feel shamed. Oh, gee, you're being too much of a wimp or something like that. That doesn't necessarily, oh, great, now I feel better. Now I'm a wimp. You know, or something. No, it's not necessarily that. It's just that, that, okay, 
you know, what do you need to, what do you want to do and what do you need to do here? And what can we as your, your fellow brothers in the support group do to help you feel strong and empowered enough to do it? Is it possible that you feel that um, it might be better that a man doesn't, at this point in his life, join a men's group? Oh, no, I can't imagine it being bad to join a men's group at any point. Um, certainly, uh, you know, if anything, as you know from probably talking with John Ince and others, is that it's been hard to really get the ball off the ground. It's not, you know, we're, you know, it's, there aren't that many people seeking it. But no, this, I don't think there's ever a bad time. Um, sometimes people spread themselves too thin in this sort of a dilettantism where people are, are, are signed up for every bloody thing and then they don't have time to attend to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of, of one's lifespan, gosh, we welcome it. I mean, the, the thing that's tough with our men's group is that we're all sort of in the same herd. We're all aging together. And when we die, it'll probably disappear. You know, we've talked about recruiting younger guys, and it's been hard to do that. <clears throat> On that note, would you speak about maybe why it's hard to recruit younger guys? Well, uh, there's not that much of an expressed interest. I think when we got together, you know, over 25 years ago, it was in the context of a, an event at, at UBC where Michael Mead... And James Hillman were talking. And so you signed up. Oh, here's an event that speaks to men. And then at the end of the event, there are these sheets around the gymnasium. And if you lived in a certain sector of Vancouver, you know, the, the lower mainland, you could sign up on the sheet and, and continue talking about the stuff that we talked about on the weekend. And so I literally, I put my name on that sheet. That's how it began for me and the guys that I'm with. And I'm so glad I did. Um, so that there's, that's like an event. Oh, people, oh, we're here to see Michael Mead. We're already interested in the men's topics anyway. Whereas that's not really happening much anymore. You don't see Michael Mead appearing much anymore. There's not, there's not events like that where, where, oh, you can draw in some energy. Like obviously at university, there's going to be younger people, etc. It's just not happening. I mean, there was, of course, a TV show, Robert Bly, that was around the same time, you know, Gathering of Men, that was on KCTS, and, and that was a big, boy, there was a lot of interest there, but again, you had a context. Oh, did you see that show? Oh, yeah, Robert Bly, what's going on with that, I, you know, Iron John, and a lot of that, those things. That's sort of a hub in terms of, of guys being able to point towards something, get interested. I just don't see it much right now. Any idea why? No, I don't. Um, I don't have a theory that maybe, you know, it takes people of a particular energy or karma. I mean, Michael Mead and Robert Bly are exceptional people. I mean, they're very compelling speakers. Um, yeah, you want to reach in your pocket and pull out some money and go see them. Um, whereas now, I mean, what I see in, in, in the context of men's movement is very good. Like you look at like Movember, you know, the movement around men's health. That's excellent. That's super. But it's the context of health. What do I need to do to prevent cancer and look after myself and lower the risks that men have that, that they need to pay attention to? That's excellent. But that's not like a, a soulful, uh, you know, at the time of Bly and Mead, they talked about the mythopoetic kind of grounding of the men's energy. Very much entwined in myth. Um, now, now some churches are doing it. There are some, you know, you see it more. I, 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 from my observation, in Christian churches, where there'll be men's groups that spring up, um, and of course, you know, Christianity's got a built-in mythology around gender differences and everything, and that's fine. Um, our church, though I'm not Christian, you know, there's a men's group there. But aside from idiosyncratic churches that have got things going, <clears throat> uh, and you just don't see it. And, that, and again, in the context of a soulful, psychological, poetic 
grounding of, of the male energy and spirit. How are you doing these last months? Uh, personally, you mean? Well, I, I think I'm doing quite well. I came back from an amazing month in Colombia. Uh, I'm not a big world traveler, but we've got friends there and we went to visit them and then we played tourist. And yeah, you know, so I mean, I've got a great life that I was able to do that. And uh, my health is somewhat compromised. I've got, you know, uh, some health issues I'm dealing with, but they're stable. You know, I just, you know, that's been going on for years. So uh, I don't have the energy I used to have, but um, uh, I just do things slower. So, uh, yeah, I can go to Bogota. It's 9,000 feet. I just, I'll catch up with you later, you know, if you're walking down the street, something like that. So, so my life is good. I've got, I don't really have anything to complain about. Um, I, I could invent something if you wanted, but I, nothing springs to mind. Uh, and I'm at the, the point in my life where I'm thinking more, you know, what is it? You know, I'm 61, so it's more like, oh, yeah. Uh, the hourglass has turned. I'll be on, on this world for approximately 20 years or less. So, you know, um, you know, that sort of infuses things with a little bit more poignancy or energy. But um, uh, no, my, my life's pretty good. Is mortality on your mind? Sure, sure. But I don't, I don't worry about it. I mean, we're all going to die. Um, it would be nice to know when I was going to die. You know, somebody said, oh, it's, you're, you're going to die on, you know, June 3rd, 2021. Oh, good. Then I can plan accordingly. Um, but uh, not knowing when that is exactly, then, then you, you feel like you have to pace yourself. Uh, but... Uh, but no, I don't. I don't fear the mortality. It's just, yeah, it's more of an alive topic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when I repair something around the house, my objective is, oh yeah, that repair will last longer than I will. So it's a lot easier to repair things. <laughs> Has it hap happened that you went into uh, the men's group with an issue, and that? after a while you realized that it was about something completely different. For example, you felt at first that the wound might be here, but by talking about it, it appeared to be something completely else. Well, that's, that's an interesting point you made because Robert Bly has that quote. He says, the wound is the womb, and that it's through the wound that we grow or, or get delivered into our destiny, etc. I never really felt wounded. I still don't feel wounded. Um, I don't come from the, the wounded background, even though I'm in the wounded industry. Um, I personally don't feel wounded. I think I have felt shallow. I have felt incredibly shallow. It's more like, I think where I was drawn to the men's movement is that it made a lot of sense. It's like there's so much trivial bullshit around maleness, masculinity, and, and, and I had a yearning for something that was more meaningful and engaging. Um, I came more from that kind of background versus, oh, I'm wounded. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm very wary about people who approach the men's, groupment, men's movement as a, as a therapeutic modality. When I get calls about men's groups, somebody phones up, it's quite often it's in the context of, oh, I need uh, advocacy to help me in my bitter divorce or I need such and such with this psychological issue. It's like, well, we're not a therapy group. You know, you're, we're here to, to share our lives with each other. It's not, again, you know, a, a means to an end in that sense. So, but yeah, a lot of people identify in the context of wound in terms of how they got into the men's movement. And I honor that. I've just had a blessed life ever since I was born. I mean, I, you know, cry me, you know, uh, being born white, middle class in North America, it doesn't get much better. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't feel that path. But I, uh, I respect it, you know, and uh, 
and th and that could be part of what's what's happening is that yeah, Mead and Bly spoke a lot in th those terms, and that's sort of yeah, it's just not a conversation that's going on much right now. Can inertia be fruitful? Yeah. In that, that's what depression is. When people are, are depressed, they're basically stuck. And I don't wish depression on anybody. Um, but when I'm working with depressed people, I encourage them to look at, okay, is there anything that you can learn from this? Is there a gift that, that things are screwing up? Uh, that you may be personally screwing up, you're, you're not engaged in things, you're away from the battlefront, that may be important what you need to do. Um, there's a, a book by Gaber Maté called When the Body Says No. That sometimes the body will rebel. It's like, like I, mean, I don't agree with, with all the premises in his book, but the basic idea is that a lot of illness is a part of your body rebelling, saying, I don't want to do what's going on. And so now I'm sick. Okay. And now you're retreating. <clears throat> so if inertia, if the thing of inertia is a, is some kind of a retreat, there's times in which that's timely and you need to do that. And sometimes that's the only time people do it is when they are, when there is some sort of a crisis and they can't move further. Um, and of course... Hopefully they get out of it. But uh, no, I mean, inertia, is, if anything, we're sometimes so distracted, we're not taking the time to pay attention to things we need to pay attention to. So in the context of a men's group, when you notice that someone is kind of, I don't know, not, things aren't moving, um, one could wonder whether it's better to to shake things up or whether to just let someone figure it out. Just, okay, you know. Yeah. Or they may be a genuinely, authentically boring person. I believe in authentic boredom. I think we have a, a, a terror of boredom. We hate boredom. You know, we fill our lives with anything, you know. Um, if I don't have something to read on a bus, I suffer. I mean, it's just, it's just awful. I always have to have something to read or something. So, um, you know, and that's one way of looking at it, that, that can I honor this person for being as bloody boring as they are? They don't have to stimulate me. Okay, maybe I'm projecting my stuff on them. They're really content with something that I think is as dumb as dirt. Who am I to, to oppose that? So um, if anything, I'm glad they're there. I don't want to be a soldier or a parking lot attendant or you know, somebody who does, uh, you know, works uh, at, a, at a, a flaying fish in an assembly line. But if somebody has found the groove and they're doing it, God bless them, you know. So... Um, you know, I think that's, that's you know, I, yeah, we, I got to be careful how much I project my ex excitement on somebody else. And all this stuff about what people feel they need to do, like as though they're, they're robbed. Oh, gee, I didn't travel to the places I wanted to travel. Well, so what, you know? All this envy we have because our lives are not as stimulating as somebody else. It's That it annoys the hell out of me. These books that say things to do before you die, like, Shut up. I think contentment is the key issue. So if, if somebody's inert and they're content, you know, I can't, I can't help take case against them. And if anything, that's the premise of Buddhism, you know, the great wisdom of, the, you know, of, of, of transcending one's desires. I, I'm nowhere near transcending my desires, but I understand it as a spiritual goal. That's great. <laughs> I can't do it. So let's say you're hosting a men's group and you notice that this is happening. Men are bored. What do you do? Well, investigate. Are we bored because we're cowards? Because we were not willing to stick our neck out to say the stuff that matters? I mean, that's an important thing to, to tease out. 
Are we bored because we're lazy? Just getting lazy brained? I mean, in, in our men's group, sometimes we do get in a lazy mode and we're just finding things a little bit repetitive. Well, then we have to install something. Okay, next week, who wants to be in charge of a topic? And then that person volunteers and then they guide us through a topic. So sometimes, you know, it's a stimulus to say, okay, maybe we need to shake something up. Um, but yeah, to at least diagnose it and investigate, where, where is this coming from? Is it coming from cowardice or is there really nothing to talk about? Um, that's usually where, where the way I think of it. Sometimes in the men's group there's uh, conflict. Is that an, an, an opportune moment to investigate something new? Oh, absolutely. And uh, that's a very important issue in men's groups because the, you know, too often they just crash and burn. There's some sort of conflict, oh, that's it, and screw it, I quit. Uh, no, you know, to, to hang in there, say, okay, um, we don't have to resolve it. Like I'm, I'm not nuts about the notion of result. Pardon me, of resolving. What we do have to do is at least honor it. Okay, you think we should turn left? I think we should turn right. And I honor you having that opinion. I think you're wrong, but I honor it. And you're honoring mine, and we can coexist in the group and have have that divergent opinion. Most men, I, I shouldn't say most because I don't have any data to point at, but our men's group, a lot of men's groups I know of, there's a basic principle of veto power. If one member does not want to go in that particular direction, then we have to honor that. Okay. Uh, and then we'll do plan B. That doesn't, you know, sometimes we go on hikes together and some hike may be too ambitious for some of the members of the group. Then fine, then we don't take that one. We take the hike that we can all join in on together, that kind of thing, rather than splitting up or something. So, um, you know, when there's conflict, you know, the challenge is to honor it and to not have it as a, as a point of departure. But if it does become a point of departure, to at least declare it as such, rather than just fade away. Sometimes you hear about guys that just don't show up anymore. You know, oh, what happened to Bill? Oh, he just quit attending. Well, that's sort of wimping out. If Bill is rebelling, he doesn't like what's going on, it's good for him to come to the group and say, you know what, guys, I respect all that you're doing, but I just cannot abide by it. I have to change the channel. I have to get out of here. That's fair enough. You know, there's nothing to debate. You know, but don't just fade away. Don't just like sort of passively disappear. It's no good. Um, so in your professional life or in your work, do you, um, have you had much experience working with uh, younger men, like men in their 30s or even 20s? Sure. Oh, yeah. Good. And um, is it like, is it voluntary or like brought by a spouse or a partner often? It's, uh, it's voluntary in that most of my clients um, see me because I'm part of their benefits program because of where they're employed, mm. they're entitled to X number of counseling sessions as, as part of their package. And so they can, they can decide whether they want to use it or not. So uh, and now I've got private clients that certainly pay out of pocket, but the majority of my clients, again, are through this benefits plan. So it's for free. Yeah, you know, so it's uh, relatively painless for them to do it. Um, and most of the men I see, yeah, they're they're willing to be there. Now, some men come to see me because they're nudged by their spouse. You know, that, oh, okay, we'll go see a counselor. You know, to me, if that makes you happy, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, that's a minority of the, of the men who I see in that context. Uh, but that's okay too, you know, just at least open the door and say, okay, especially in a relationship counseling, the man may be reluctant, but at least he's there. Now, the, the guys who are really reluctant are the teenage males, you know, like teenage women, they're not necessarily reluctant. 
they're more comfortable talking about their lives in general. But um, when I see a teenage male, it's it's more in the context of, oh yeah, I got to do this to make mom or dad more comfortable or happy because they're worried about me. They're actually the ones with the problem, perhaps in his mind. But um, but yeah, in that context, it's it's more sort of a coerced hmm. with a really young man. Do you notice any commonalities um, amongst younger men feeling feeling lost or frustrated with themselves or isolated from elders or father figures or other male figures? Not that they would express that. That's not an issue that they would present. But in the course of talking with a lot of young men, I can tell that that's going on. That their values are very sort of, you know, maybe confused or superficial, that they aren't feeling grounded and necessarily in their identity or their role in society and things like that. And, and that's where mentorship of an older male is really important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're probably not even talking with other men about what they're going through. So they don't even know where they stand in terms of what's normal or not. Like, is this weird or what? You know, so um, a lot of people are self-conscious about just issues of normalcy. Am I weird or what? Very common. Hmm. And uh, yeah, if there's not men in their lives that they trust or feel comfortable with. and Now, in, in some situations, it's a no-brainer because of tradition. So especially, let's say, in a particular religion or a culture. Oh, I, I, I know who I am and how I fit in because that's... That's my culture. That's what we do. Okay. You know, so it's, um, you know, it may be very different than my culture, et cetera, but that at least they feel at home with it. Oh, good. I'm, I'm of this background. I can do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on why... Um, would you say a majority of men are are not comfortable um, maybe being authentic or a little more emotionally available with other men? Well, a quote I love is from uh, Wilhelm Reich, who's kind of an interesting character. But anyway, is that a lot of our motivation is about making sure that we're liked by somebody and that we can make money. Am I going to say something that's going to jeopardize my capacity to make money or have friends? Mm -hmm. And that's a basic fear. And I mean, I have that fear. I operate by that. I'm, I, I'm incredibly self-conscious, uh, regrettably so. I mean, that's something I'm trying to work on personally to be a little bit more authentic or candid and things like that. But in the back of my head is the notion of impression management. I have to look good. You know, I have to, you know, not do anything that's going to interfere with my profession, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that self-consciousness, that, you know, doubt, et cetera. But I think... It's loosening up. I mean, by God, I mean, there's some people who seem to be utterly unembarrassable. You know, when you look at today, like, you know, I feel like I'm some sort of old timer. You know, some of the music that young people are singing, like, it's just, it's insanely cruel and shallow. Like, wow, you feel really comfortable with lyrics like that. I guess you're quite confident, you know, mm. um, that, that I would have never... You know, you know, a lot of the, this cruel rap music that denigrates women. I would have never thought about singing crap like that when I was a kid. No way. You want the approval of women. So, so there, there are some young people who seem unembarrassable mm -hmm. and unselfconscious. But, uh, but yeah, I think, I think, uh, you know, 
it'd be nice for all, all young men to feel more strong in, their, in, in, in that sense of like coming of age rituals. Like, uh, I mean, bar mitzvahs are when a young a Jewish boy is 13. That may be a little bit too young. I mean, I was confirmed in the Christian faith. I was around 13, 14. So some of the things that we regard as traditional coming of age, they're way too young, actually. Hmm. I mean, there are people who are in their 30s and 40s who haven't come of age in terms of really embracing adulthood. And, and, the, uh, and the distractions in our life around, and this is something that Mead and Bly were very concerned about, it's called the puer eternus, the eternal boy. There's a lot of people who are, are very old boys. That, that their values are utterly that superficial. They really want to just get the nice car and have, you know, X amount of affluence, get laid and, and drink heavily or whatever. And, that, and, that, and, and their checklist is ticked off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've lived the hedonistic, materialistic lifestyle. And they aren't necessarily complaining about it, except if they don't have it. So there's, there's that which can cause alienation with one's soul and one's identity as a man and the like. But um, uh, anyway, I'm just sort of, you know, musing on different hypotheses. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some of the long-term effects of, um, of maintaining a very rigid, like, self-containment and um, uh, vigilance of social status and not, like, just, like, letting loose and... And expressing, so to say, opening your heart to to others around you, maybe others aside from your intimate partner. Like I've, um, my my understanding is that a lot of a lot of men get in that habit of of only maybe being vulnerable or emotionally available with their intimate partner, and and sort of putting on that that face or that strong that strong foot forward in pretty much all of the other relationships in their life. And um, so I, I wonder, and maybe even professionally, you've seen what are some of the, the long-term effects of, of keeping that very rigid containment? Well, if that rigid containment is based on the notion that, okay, my love life with this, let's say, one woman, my spouse or whoever it is I'm very attached to, that that's going to deliver all of my emotional needs... And that, and that that's a premise behind their rigidity. Yeah, that's that's foolishness. That's that's that that will ultimately crash. And that no one person can deliver all the emotional needs. And then you go off and be this other character elsewhere in society, and and not feel connected with those people, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that that's one of the the, the leading causes of divorce is people think, oh gee, this person isn't as perfect as they, I thought they were. Of course not. Nobody's meant to be perfect. No one person can deliver all the food groups of human relationship. So that, that's one cost of the rigidity. I mean, I'm sort of ambivalent about rigidity in that sometimes there's a benefit to it that I gave a talk once called Craving a Hot Dogma. I mean, I love dogma. I, I don't really have much of any dogma I used to. I used to have lots of dogma in my early days. And I kind of miss it, because at least I knew how, how things worked. I was very rigid. and I mean, I was wrong, but it was, uh, there was a peace of mind to it. So let's say if I was some guy in ISIS or Al-Qaeda, I may be wrong, I may be murderous and, and all like that, but by God, I'm utterly confident about how things work <laughs> and that, oh yes, I'll be delivered to heaven, etc. I mean, if anything I've read on ISIS is that it's very, very fundamentalist. You know, so, so the advantage is, yeah, it's going to be easier for me to be a killer. You know, I mean, there are advantages. If you want to have soldiers, you want to have people who are desensitized to life, you have to be rigid. Uh, but that's not my goal. I don't, you know, I'm not looking forward to killing a bunch of people or anything. But, but that's that's sort of the classic desensitization thing. We have to get desensitized to do cruel things. Um, 
and it may even be the business world, whatever world you're in, is that, oh, yeah, I have to be detached or desensitized. I have to hire and fire people. I have to, whatever it is I'm doing, you know, that it would be too hard to do it if I was too attuned mm -hmm. to all, all that I was engaged with. So, you know, it's a, it's a give and take around that, that rigidity stuff. But in the most part, it's, it's quite punishing and life denying. I mean, I guess to uh, to be in any sort of lasting relationship uh, with a woman or, or anyone that takes a certain level of, of comfort with expressing oneself, um, what would you say about maybe uh, men for whatever reason, childhood trauma or anything, um, like really isolate themselves and are, and are just don't feel safe at all to, to, to be vulnerable, to express themselves freely and... Um, and just lead a very kind of lonely sort of uh yeah like self-isolating life what uh, you know in, in your knowledge of the of the human psyche what would you say are some some results or sort of um, long long-term effects of that kind of self-isolation or just superficial kind of interactions in the world well i mean it's, it's interesting that you're raising that now because when you watch the news you see a lot of health studies and things that a very stable you know conclusion is that for one thing you're not going to live as long you're going to die quicker mm. isolation is inherently an unhealthy thing married people live longer than unmarried people um you can theorize whatever reason that there is for that, but that, um, you know, my clients, you know, when they're dealing with addiction, quite often it's in the context of isolation. I mean, in that, yeah, they're drinking alone. That's, that's a real sign when somebody's got a problem, that they're consuming whatever it is they're consuming alone. Mm. Um, and, you know, when you look at, at at any sort of a support group, I mean, there's men's groups, there's there's groups in, in almost any subject matter that that the, the classic big daddy of all groups is AA. Well, where did that come from? What was around the notion of fellowship? Rather than being alone in your room or whatever, you're meeting other alcoholics. And you've got some support there. Yeah. So, you know, any load is easier to carry if, if you're able to share it or feel a connection with others. Mm. Yeah. So you talked a little bit earlier about uh, noticing like, it's, it's very hard to get younger men involved in men's circle and our men's group. And, um, and I guess I, I, I've noticed that myself, there maybe seems to be a, a lack of, of respect or interest for younger men to even, to even open up or, or initiate like connecting with, with elders and kind of receiving any, any advice, any wisdom to be passed on. There's a, perhaps a, a, often an attitude that uh, you know, the younger men feel they, they, they know better. And um, yeah, and I, I guess I, it saddens me a lot when I when I learn more about uh, you know tribal history and some of the the rites of passage kind of things and how the elders would really um, like really take initiative you know probably sometimes even a, against a, a younger man's uh, choice or will at that time to to kind of yeah initiate them into into their adulthood and. Actually, that Robert Bly, I think, mentions that often when, when teenagers start like dyeing their hair and getting piercings and stuff, it's, it's a call out for that initiation. And in, in older times, the elders would, would, would notice that and go like, oh, hey, like, you know, here's, well, I mean, he says kind of uh, amusingly, like the, the old men would dance and tell stories for three days. And, and then the younger, uh, the, the younger adults would would uh go oh wow like that's what it means to be an adult actually like these guys can really like cut loose and, and be you know really out there and that somehow helps them like uh, i don't know be more okay or more accepting of themselves and 
I think what we see a lot of today is, is you know, when the children start sort of rebelling or acting out with their appearance and stuff, there's just a like, oh, okay, well, let's just like tolerate this. It's a phase. So they'll, they'll move through it. They'll, they'll find their way out of it. And um, yeah, I just wonder what your perspectives on, on how to, from, from both sides, from, you know, maybe advice for the, the younger men who, uh, you know, realize they're, they're seeking something or advice for the, the older men of like how much initiative or how much responsibility to take in, in forming that, that connection and, and whatever, exchanging that, that information of, of what it means to be in, move into adulthood. Well, in terms of what's going on with young men, I don't have anything very intelligent to say because I don't know many young men, mm-hmm. um, much less know what what attracts them or repels them from fellowship with older men. So I, I, I just, I really don't know. But in terms of what older men can do to draw them in more, what I... My hunch is when I'm working, because obviously my clients tend to be more on the older side than the younger, but that then the idea of being able to offer a blessing to somebody who's younger. You know, how can I bless a young man that I meet? Either they're a family member or they may even be a stranger to be supportive of that young person. And if I disqualify myself like, oh God, well, who am I? I'm just some idiot, I got nothing to offer this kid, et cetera, et cetera. Then it just all fizzles away and we all disqualify ourselves as not having a blessing or a gift to give to that young person. So like a a classic case is let's say the separated father who feels overwhelmed because of the battles with the ex-wife and ends up abrogating any sort of connection with the kids. Oh, it doesn't matter. Let her have her way and and the kids... uh, think I'm a jerk too because they're listening to what mom is saying or whatever, whatever. He's ending up disqualifying himself even as a father. Mm. You know, so, I mean, that's terrible. So when I, when I encounter that with my separated fathers, I do whatever I can to help encourage them to say, whatever history or dispute you've had, you are definitely the father. You have something to offer. Um, and and even with a stranger that, that when we... You know, how often do we engage anybody publicly? You know, like if, if, like, you know, if there's a dispute on the bus, people usually just sort of sit back and let it evaporate or the bus driver addresses it. The other passengers don't. You know, that in other cultures, people are more free to sort of jump up and say, no, I'm going to jump in the fray here. I'm going to do what I can to, to be of assistance to this young person who may be in a dispute or something. You know, that, that, that I have that confidence or that power to do that. And they can take it or leave it, you know. Um, so that's what I find is that a lot, of, a lot of men just disqualify themselves. You know, I don't really have that much to offer anyway. Okay. Now, what's nice is that there's a, 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 you know, a, a deliberate method around this, say, like with big brothers. You know, our big brother saying, hey, we're a nonprofit organization trying to match you know, older men with kids who are, you know, may very well be of single parent families, et cetera. But, you know, what can we do to, to match that? I think that's a great idea. Now, it's deliberate, it's bureaucratic. You have to apply and fill in forms and have a criminal record check and do all that stuff, you know. But at least it's in the right direction. Say, yeah, you know, it's unfortunate we have to be bureaucratic in some contexts. But if it could be informal, you know, that, that, uh, that's ideal. Like in, in our church, as soon as a you know a kid hits around twenty, then they split. You know, we oh God, we'd love them to stay. You know, stick around. Oh, no, they got to. And 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 it'd be nice, you know, if, if more of us in that context just got more personally involved with each young person that was there. Okay. Are you a father? Oh yeah, yeah. I've got two kids in their thirties. Yeah, boy, girl. Yeah, uh, uh, yep. Uh, my son's thirty-three. My daughter's thirty-seven. What would you say was your most um, 
important or significant contribution as a father to their lives? I think just exposing them to the world the way we did. We were always, you know, growing up, we'd go camping, we'd go traveling. We were always uh, out there. It doesn't mean they still do it. I mean, our, our kids are not as involved with nature as we are. You know, so it, it hasn't taken hold in the same way that, that nature is part of our lives. But uh, that, I mean, if this is the first thing that comes to my mind is that a lot of families don't take their kids out into nature, do it, you know, go backpacking up into the wild and pitch a tent and, and things like that. So I think we've been good at, at exposing our kids to stuff. What was your, um, how, how, what's your approach to handling like rebellion or that, that active stand for freedom and independence for like teenage, your, your children as teenagers? Well, you know, you can't really obstruct it. I mean, that's, I never really had a prophecy for either of my kids. It wasn't like, oh, my son or daughter were supposed to be this or that. Oh, you know, gee, you got to pursue this career or pursue this thing. You know, in my generation, you hear a lot of people talking about grandchildren. They're hot to have grandchildren. I don't care if I have grandchildren or not. I certainly don't impose it on my kids. I don't care. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's futile to think you're going to really be able to shape them. I think the key thing is, is the respect by now. I don't care. What they do is on there, there, there's still a sense of of mutual respect and honor amongst ourselves. Yeah, you can be doing. You know, my son has very different political beliefs than I have. Okay, you know, um, that's his prerogative. I had, I had very different political beliefs than my father. That's sort of kind of the chain of life. That's the way it works. You know, the you know the kids tend to rebel against the parent. Um, but no, I've never, I've never felt I had to nudge or push in any direction. What about the opposite? Like, did your feeling of needing to like protect when like, because of a uh, teenager's naivety or, or overactive, whatever passion or rebelliousness, like feeling, um, yeah, when they feel that they might do something to really get themselves in a, in a difficult situation that you're concerned of, how how would you approach sort of protecting them or having boundaries for them? Well, I've been fortunate in that my kids have not challenged dangers very much. I haven't, mm. I haven't felt much in the way of urgency of having to save them from something. But that, you know, in terms of what the decisions they're facing in their lives, that... You know, I always tell them, you know, you know, I say, if you have any questions or if there's anything you can ask of me, then ask me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to impose it, you know, because if you impose it, that's it almost guarantees they won't do whatever you impose anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so as a resource to say, you know, uh, I'm here. You know, no matter what happens, you're always loved and we're always supportive of you. That's the main message. Um, and, and, and my wife and I, I think, you know, endeavor to always deliver that. Um, so would you say it's perhaps because of that, that clear availability and uh, love and encouragement for them that they didn't have that need to, to act out or challenge danger or test test your, your limits no. or feel that safety from you because there was that, that, that attention, maybe really just that, that attentiveness there? No, I, I don't take credit for it. I don't think we take credit for it in that we've inoculated them from it. It's just, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's just been fortunate that that's been a moot point. So let's say like I've had friends whose kids have been 
you know, addicted to really pernicious drugs like crystal meth or something. You know, and that's hard to be a spectator to. It's hard to be on the sidelines of where you do want to jump in there like some sort of police and, 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 and crush it and eradicate it. That kind of thing, you know. No, we've never had to, to witness something like that. Uh, or something, you know, so, you know, particularly foolish or self-destructive. So, um, much less take credit because they haven't had those dangers. They could still have those dangers. Um, yeah, I think, I, you know, I think, you know, what, what, what can a parent offer? I mean, it's just like, I think that's basically it. My parents were very, um, Passive. I think all, as long as they fed the kids, I mean, we were fed, and that was basically it. Good. Not that, I mean, they loved us, but it's not like today where you got these parents driving their kids to every soccer, piano lesson, all this over engagement of parents. My parents gave me a huge freedom. I was able to just come home at supper time. I'd be out in the fields, I'd be out, you know, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. I could have gotten killed. They didn't worry about it. Again, I don't think they wanted to get killed or anything. But they had a basic abiding trust. Yeah, he'll be home for supper. Okay. I like that, you know. Some people might say, was that neglect? No, I think that's that's a gift. So we gave our kids freedom to do the things they want to do. And, and knock on wood, they never got harmed. I mean, they had their own struggles or pains, but there was no big calamity. You participated in, in any other <clears throat> men's groups aside from the the one you've been in for was it fifteen or so years? Oh no, since nineteen ninety, twenty six years. Um, no, I had no other men's groups in the sense of a fellowship of a commitment to a group of people who meet regularly. Like there, our men's group meets every other week. Um, I'm always interested in the men's movement, as you know. With John Nancy and I, tried to facilitate helping men's groups get off the ground. Uh, I attend events where, where that's the subject matter, and I'm open to doing it again, though I haven't been involved with anything for some time. Um, yeah, so no, in, in terms of my daily life, the, the, the sole thing has been my men's group. And you take turns hosting, is that right? Yeah. So in your experience hosting and also being hosted, what would you say are some of the, the key factors or the most important things to, to, to be aware of, like to be a, a avid host? or a, a... I mean, the number one thing is privacy. That, that's, and that's hard to engineer sometimes. That Yeah. Uh, who else is going to be in the household? Are they going to be in earshot? You know, you want to have a complete sense of confidence that you're not in earshot of other people. That's the that's that's the single hardest thing to engineer, mm. and and our families are pretty respectful of that. You know, my wife is often involved with something else on the same evenings if we're hosting something here, or she'll be upstairs or something like that. So the key thing is just not having interference. Um, but uh, the uh, no hosting is actually a very easy thing to do you know yeah you have some tea or something available you know but uh the main thing is just okay are we in a circle we're going to be able to have you know about two and a half un un uninterrupted hours mm -hmm. you know turn off your cell phones and all that stuff you know so that's the that's the logistics are the biggest challenge mm -hmm. So I, mean, I guess you guys have been together so long, there's, there's certainly a, a very deep sense of comfort there, familiarity with each other. But um, would you have any advice for, for someone who's hosting or, or just beginning interactions in a, in a very new men's group of how to create that sense of comfort or safety for expression? Yes, my number one advice is to have a basic commitment to get off the ground, let's say, you know, there's been an initial meeting and, you know, everybody's a stranger and they're getting to know each other. And now that they've decided, okay, we're going to have a group, you have to have a commitment of attending every session for at least the first five sessions. You know, just 
with no excuses, just everybody attends the first five. Then you can decide if you're going to make a commitment to the group. That it takes about five sessions for things to really start to connect. And there's, you've probably seen like that workbook by Gervais Bouche, which we used. It's excellent. Because uh, it had structured topics for those first five sessions. Good. And we've made a commitment to attending these now. So is that the handbook? Yeah, the handbook. You gave me that was written by Vancouver Mountain? No, it, yes. The one that I gave you is based on the one that Mark is talking about. Oh, okay. okay. That, um, that's, that's the key thing is that you've got the commitment for that time period. Okay. Then we'll check in with each other if we are now a group and now who wants to continue from this moment on. Somebody may decide, you know what, I, I did the five weeks. It's not really for me. Fine, then they can disengage. Good. But when people don't have that at least initial commitment, then you don't get any momentum at all. And, uh, and that's really important. And the other thing is, you know, as I said, that the notion around honoring discord is that we don't have to agree on things as long as we're respectful and we honor each other through the conflicts. Um, easier said than done, but that's really important to keep keep the group together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, those are the first things that come to my mind. Have you had any other... Uh... Any other careers in your life before being a therapist? Careers? Oh, yeah. I was a taxi driver. I was, I was a culinary engineer in charge of utensil maintenance internationally. I was a dishwasher. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, what inspired you to want to, to enter the line of work that you, uh, you are in? Well, I was, initially I wanted to be a teacher when I went to university. Psychology is just such a great topic. I mean, you know, when I went to university, and I took up my that first introductory psychology. I just took it as an elective. Oh yeah, let's just see what psychology is like. It's so utterly interesting. That's all. I just you know like oh, and and I didn't leave once I took that course and I changed my major from education to psychology. Uh, but I actually it was not the first career I pursued. I pursued uh, construction trades, but at that time. It was easier to get into graduate school psychology than to get into the trades. Now it's the other way around. But um, you know, I had a young family, and I thought I'm going to have to get some money happening. And and uh, my my background is in the trades with my father and all. And so I thought, yeah. But it was a no go. So that when the university said, "Hey, you want to do graduate work here?" I said, "Sure." And the rest is history. You know, it was great. I'm glad I did it. And and. Uh, uh, but no, I love counseling. I've always been involved in some sort of a helping capacity anyway. You know, so when people ask me, how long have I been a counselor? I say, well, I've been paid money for it since 1981. But I did it before then, just in terms of the context with my friends and family. I've always been, you know, that, that person who ended up talking with people when they were troubled. Is there something that the love from a woman can do that men cannot give each other? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I mean, I shouldn't say that because I'm not of a, of, a, of a gay mentality. You know, I haven't had erotic love with men, so I can't speak of experience. But, I mean, you know, women deliver us from our sorrows. I mean, women are the closest thing to heaven that a man experiences. I don't think there is a heaven. I think, I think when you're dead, you're dead. But the, the closest thing to heaven on earth is a woman. Um, so, you know, in terms of some self you know, an erotic self-transcendence. Um, yeah, that's... No, men can't do that. I mean, maybe gay, gays probably have erotic self-transcendence. Uh, I, I just can't speak to it. But boy, you know, ego, everything just dissolves in uh, sex with a woman. I mean, you're just, you're just in another land. You're just gone. 
but beyond the the erotic relationship what about just the normal interaction oh yes yes i mean because a whole other mentality you know that that you know the 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 considerations that a woman brings into any sort of endeavor are so much more sensible and you know it's like like the uh I love it. You know, there, I saw a documentary recently about the economic collapse. And Iceland was one of the most devastated countries in the 2008 collapse of the, uh, you know, subprime por mortgages and all that stuff. Anyway, the only bank that didn't foreclose was the one run by women. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we're soon, America will soon have an, a female president. I think that's going to be great. You know, uh, that there's probably going to be more care and nurturing and thoughtfulness uh, with women as leaders than men. Men are more likely to do stupid things. You know, if you're thinking we're planning for the long term, who's better to be at the steering wheel in a long term plan? It's better to have a woman than a man. You know, you look at divorce, the st stats for women, it's much better for women than men, not financially. Women are more likely to get screwed legally. But in terms of health and longevity, they look after themselves after a divorce, or men is more likely to do something stupid, like buy a dumb car or drink heavily and listen to country and western music incessantly or something. I mean, the men's, a man's path of self-care is very different than a woman's. What have you done that's really stupid? Oh, God. Profoundly stupid. Um, I, it sounds so arrogant. I feel like Donald Trump or something. I can't come up with a thing. Uh, oh, I know I've done things really stupidly. Um, oh, yeah, I took some. I took some risks that I shouldn't have taken. Uh, I was a pretty crazy teenager in terms of my. You know. I would climb things that you shouldn't climb, drive at speeds that you shouldn't drive, um, you know, uh, drink heavily uh, as a teenager in high school, stuff like that. So my, my teenage years were pretty intense. Hey, Giselle. Um, yeah, that's what I think of sort of like danger. I've taken more risks than I needed to take. Uh, sort of like, thank God I'm here. Mm. Um, what is it like to talk about something like that on camera? Oh, it's easy. It's no problem. I mean, because I think every man has a history of like really dangerous, stupid stuff that he survived from, from about age 15 to 25. There's... There's any number of things a man can point to and say, that's amazing, I'm still here after doing that. Um, I was kind of hoping that you would say that there's a little bit of shame about talking, uh, about having made uh, mistakes, doing stupid things. Shame is an interesting uh, emotion. Shame, oh yeah. Um, but the shame comes more from the outside and then it being shamed you know like that that i've done stupid things where i scold myself like oh god damn it i could have killed myself but shame let's say that 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 yeah if i do something that disappoints my wife and she'll shame at me occasionally for it yeah that's very painful but that's more coming from her Rather than an internal thing, like, oh, God, I, I'm so ashamed that I did X, Y, Z. Um, she may be more astute at informing me on, on new ways that what I did was stupid that I had not previously seen. So um, in terms of the way I've carried myself in public, things that I've said in public, my sense of humor can be quite high risk, you know, the way I dress and stuff like that. So... Um, yeah, relatively 
small potatoes. She's a pretty generous person in terms of allowing me to be who I am. And, uh, and I'm very appreciative. We've been together 41 years now. So she's a great partner that way. But occasionally she'll, she'll give me a shot if she thinks I'm lowering standards. Is shame easy to overlook for men that they say, no, it's something else, like I'm, I'm angry, but no, I'm not ashamed. Is it one of those emotions that we put aside, that we tuck away? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's like that distinction between shame and guilt, that, that you know, shame so it deals with sort of a sense of worth, you know. Now I'm, I'm, I have less worth. Guilt is more like causing harm. Oh God, I actually caused harm to somebody. I feel guilty. I feel terrible about that. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's almost like trying to prevent shame. It's like, it's almost like, like asshole prevention. Like there's a lot of things that I do solely to not be an asshole, like a thank you card. Which I, I hate thank you cards. As soon as you know, and I don't hate them. I mean, I send them. And so, but it's like, oh God, I better send a thank you card, or I'm an asshole. It's not. I mean, I'm genuinely grateful. I told them I was grateful when they gave it to me. This is a great dinner. Thank you for the dinner. Now that we've had the dinner, I have to send you a card on top of that. That's social convention. Because if I don't, then I'm going to be an asshole. So. Um, You know, and that's what I say about my self-consciousness. I mean, there's things I do in public. I better do it this way or that way or else I'll be seen as being an asshole. Okay. <laughs> I'll do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, like, when, you th when, when people are dealing, I mean, obviously in issues around recovery, when they quit drinking or, or whatever they're doing, and I'm counseling through it, You have to deal with the element of shame and 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 to, and to feel that oh, you're still a good, worthy person. Yeah, you embarrassed yourself and your family. You did all sorts of stuff, but you're still okay. You know, I mean that's one of the great gifts of the twelve steps. Not that I'm here to 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 uh, uh, sing that the, the virtues of that versus any other you know, way for somebody to stay sober, but the 12 steps of AA deal a lot with guilt and shame. To sort of feel like, okay, yeah. And though they don't use the word asshole, they're basically saying, yeah, you were an asshole and, and you're on the other side of it, you know? So uh, like Louis C.K., who's my hero of a comic, I don't know if you're familiar with him. God, the guy's a genius. He's totally filled with self-disgust and shame. That's part of his comedy. And he owns it. He says, yep, that's, that's what I did. Um, and, uh, and we all love him for it. He's our hero of public self-embarrassment. But he's kind of going the opposite way. Like, I'm ashamed of this, so I'm going exactly towards the, I'm going to talk about the thing. Yes, that's right. I'm now, yeah, I'm unembarrassable. I'm, I'm, I'm telling the world about uh, my eating uh, and sexual habits and everything, and and uh, and yep, that's that's right. And it's quite liberating, you know. Uh, and Amy Schumer, I think, does that on on the female side of the fence, you know, like you know, train wreck and the stuff that she does is like a really kind of a, a crazy wigged out woman. But you love her. It's that she's so utterly honest and self-disclosing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um. So Louis C.K. probably uses this as a technique. He's very, very um, aware that, well, it's good for his career, but it's also healing for himself. I burned my hand a couple of weeks ago in the oven. And uh, it's almost gone. It's, uh, it's healed by itself. Now, your specialty is more uh, the welfare of people's emotions. So what self-healing...
processes are built in the human psyche. I think uh, one of the self-healing things is to courageously look at whatever that wound is that you actually, you know, you burned your hand and you're looking at it and you're addressing it. You didn't pretend it wasn't there. That, um, you know, the metaphor of the guy who's got the mole on his hand and, and his friend says, well, you should get that checked out. And he says, oh, no, I don't want to get it checked out. No, just go, go to a doctor, get it checked out. Well, no, I don't really want to. Well, why not? Well, I'm afraid of what it is. Well, that's the whole idea about getting checked out. That's why it's called get it checked out. The number one most successful path of treating cancer is early detection. You have to look at it. So, um, you know, uh, you know th that that's something we can all do is to just, by God, at least have the courage to look at what it is that you're actually doing. And then, then you can decide if you want to keep doing it or not. So, you know, people who are obese, like, yep, I'm really disgusting. I'm 350 pounds, but... Uh, I really love pizza and I have no desire to quit eating the numbers of pizzas I eat. I have respect for that. I mean, it's great. Versus somebody who denies that they're obese or makes empty promises about losing weight and crap like that, which is utterly boring. You know, either lose weight or order the pizza. You know, just address the thing and you're either going to do something about it or not. But to do it openly, yeah. Um, that's one of the things I love about about my my little fragments of any knowledge about the way the Dutch do things is that they're very open about it. Yes, oh yes, we've got X number of drug users, and and we're just deciding to not, you know, castigate them as we once did. Yeah, you know? okay, that's part of Dutch society. Okay, and and they can. And there'll be less harm, you know, the old harm reduction hypothesis and stuff, you know, which is a good, I mean, model. So, yeah, the self-healing comes from at least looking at it. Yep, that's that's me. That's part of who I am. So uh, that's why I love doing house calls. When I do house calls with people, I see more about how they actually live versus when they come to my office. And uh, I learn so much more. What can we learn by looking at your interior? Oh, I mean, you get some insights about, obviously, my tastes and my my interests. And uh, yeah, so, what do we see? What are yeah, your tastes? I think. Uh, what, do we, what does it tell us about you? Well, that I'm into people feeling comfortable and at home, and and you use what you have. You go to some homes, you don't want to sit in the chair. You think you're going to damage it. This this house is a love tub, you know. You be here and have fun, have a good time, and and I I love books, and you may or may not like the books I select, but uh, you know I like you know it's like a little nest of my interests and, and Shirley's interests, and and uh, and the ideas around I think really comfort and conviviality. And I was offered tea, and I was offered cookies, and I didn't get a cookie. I got a whole plate full of cookies, several to choose from. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Oh, I think it feels safer. I think that, that there's a danger with men in, in that for one thing I mean even even just statistically the person most likely to kill you will be a man rather than a woman okay so if you're gonna get in any sort of danger or trouble in conflict it's always more dangerous with a man um, and and women are are more compassionate and they want to they want to hear about it. Oh, tell me about it. And I'm like, men don't always want to hear about it. How are you doing? I'm fine. Good. That's good. Let's go play golf. Let's go do whatever we're doing. 
um, a woman wants the details, you know. So, so yeah, a lot of that comfort, you know. Why why put your hand in the cage and get at risk of it getting bitten by a male when if I put my hand in a female cage, it may get soothed and comforted. Okay. You know, just like the father and the mother, right? The mother, the mother's always going to love, mother's always going to love what you're doing no matter what. Oh, thank you for the little crayon drawing, even though it looks like hell. Oh, it's your crayon drawing. That's great. The dad doesn't care. What the hell is this? It's a, I don't know. What are you drawing there? Jesus, you know. So fathers are always more conditional. Men tend to be more conditional. No, I shouldn't say that. Women are more picky. Uh, but uh, men are, are more stingy with love. So your fathers are not good for showing your crayon drawing to what are fathers good for? Um, well... Ideally, to inform you of what adulthood is, this is what this is what you're going to be encountering when you grow up. Now, the father's not the best person because he's, he's actually so biased because you're the son, and he's going to be having more particular visions about you. And that's why they say it's good to be initiated by the uncles. Or the people outside the family, they're not going to be as cautious or pandering to the son, you know. So, yeah. But, I mean, the gift that my father gave me was that I saw how he did things. That's why I wanted to be in the building trades, you know, that he was a sheet metal worker. I should do that. That's what a real man has to be a, a real worker. There's a bit of a riddle about the relationship men have with anger. What do you make of it? A riddle in the sense that there's some sort of paradox about it or? or... It feels good, but it is sometimes bad. Um, it is an opening to other feelings. There's usually something behind it. But do we as men go beyond the anger or do we, do we just stay angry? Well, I mean, yeah, and that's the tough part because anger tends to be one of the more comfortable emotions to acknowledge and to be in. And often what's behind the anger is fear. I'm afraid of something, but I'm not so comfortable sharing my anxieties or fears, but I'm a hell of a lot more comfortable letting you know my disapproval or anger. So yeah, that's 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 something that, that's a challenge for all of us individually to overcome and say, can I speak to my fears more? Um, you know, so that probably happens more with men than women, but it happens with women too, you know, that 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 you know there's often fear behind the anger. Um, now, you know, can we take the time to sort of have that reflection? Oh, yes, gee, I, I want to say this really cruel thing, but can I just give myself a little bit of time before I open my mouth? So there's, a, there's that element of patience. And, and men, like everybody else, need to be more patient. And um, again, that's easier said than done. But when you look at anger management work that people do, <coughs> and I, I work with quite a few angry men who are clients, and then they go onwards to do things that specialize on anger management, maybe a support group around anger management, and to really be patient to say, I have to just sit still and be quiet and listen to the other person before I then open my mouth. That's a real challenge, you know. Is there something you still hope to work on yourself? 
In terms of anger or just in general? In general. In general? Well, yes, I mean, certainly my self-consciousness, I, I, I hope to be uh, more free around that. I mean, when I think of people like Allen Ginsberg, who's one of my heroes, uh, God, he was just, he was one of the most public, you know, personally exposed guys you ever want to meet. Not, you know, not that I met him or something, but I mean, I mean, I admired him as a poet. And I used to see him when he'd come to Vancouver. So yeah, that I'm working on myself, but also, you know, to put my shoulder to the wheel of something you know, that that's a good project for social action. I used to be very involved in the nuclear disarmament movement. You know, I used to spend a lot of time doing things politically around it, socially organizing things. Now what I do is I just write checks. You know, I'm interested in something, somebody needs help, fine, I'll write a check. That's very easy to do. I mean, you know, thank goodness, you know, I've, I've got the wherewithal that I, you know, not that I give big money or something, but I feel good. Oh, great. I gave a check for the Syrian refugees. I'm not hosting a refugee. My wife and I are talking about ways that we might be able to be more involved with that. So that I'm working on, I have to get more engaged in social action in a, in a, in a concrete way aside from writing a check. Excuse me. Um, I'm engaged politically. I'm active with my political party and things like that, but but to really identify things. So, so one uh, idiosyncratic thing I'm, I'm quite interested in is the threat to frogs. I love frogs. And uh, BC is the last a, a habitat for a very rare frog. I won't go into all the details, but there's a species of frog. There's only a few hundred of them left in the world, and they're in BC. And I should look at ways that I can be of more help there around that. I mean, that's... This particular environmental issue, but there's other issues that that intrigue me too. But I'm just lazy. See, I'd say it's my laziness. I just I'm, I've been too passive. I've got to put my shoulder to the wheel more. So the big question, obviously, is: Are you good enough? Just in general. Well, I heard you say I should, I should, I should. Oh, uh, oh yeah, no, I'm good enough in the universe. Like I, 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 I justify the oxygen I inhale. And, and things like that. Oh yeah, I don't. Uh, I have no regrets. I think I think the world is better that I'm here than not being here. Um, oh yeah, uh, it's like it's like there's an absolute and a relative measure of things, right? So in Mississippi. People are gigantic. I don't know if you've ever been to Mississippi. There are huge people there. They eat a hell of a lot of food. So let's say, for sake of argument, the average weight of a man in Mississippi is 230 pounds, let's say. Okay, that's a statistical norm. That's your average Mississippian. Now, is that healthy? Is that good? Well, no, the doctor will say you should be 185. So, yeah, there's relative normal, and then there's the absolute normal. And the relative normal... I'm great, you know. <laughs> I got nothing to to uh, be ashamed about. But in the absolute normal, no, I've got work to do, you know. <laughs> <coughs> you know, uh, there's there's things, yeah, the shoulds that I should be involved in. But compared to the rest of the people in the world, I'm doing all right. Thank you for this interview. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. It's quite flattering to be interviewed.